We uh, are going to this book by Nancy Guthrie, and um, you don't have to read it if you don't want to. You can just come. But if you got it, it's a good read. Um, and so last week we were looking at the book of Ruth, mainly this, the, the, the character Naomi, um, and kind of her ups and downs. And early on, after all of her tragedy, she uh, says, don't call me Naomi. Naomi means blessed, but call me Mara, which means bitter. And so we talked some about um, uh, that, you know, kind of her, her ups and downs. Uh, and so we're going to look at somebody else uh, today that has a lot go wrong for him pretty quickly. And uh, in many ways, it feels pretty cruel. And so we'll get to that in a minute. But I want to ask you, before we get to his story, uh, have you ever felt like life is, was cruel to you? Life was cruel. Like, sometimes, sometimes bad things happen because we make bad decisions, you know, like we just face consequences. But sometimes it's just that it just feels mean. And you're not really sure who to blame, but it just feels like life's cruel. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody having moments like that? Yeah, you got you got examples like that, Chris? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the third. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Does anybody else, anybody got anything that's any times you in your life where you just look up and you're like, really? This? Yeah, physical sickness definitely. It's some you just just don't know. We've had lots of uh, sleepless nights, and there's something about being tired that you get, and you're just like, why? You know, like crying again, baby. Like just just feel like again. And we had two nights ago, Amber just didn't sleep well, and so when my phone rang two times, it to whatever this morning she was like what is that <laughs> so i leave my phone on, i don't I, I rarely get calls in the middle of the night but like since we're foster parents i just feel like you never know it's happened a couple times where we've missed calls so i start leaving my phone on loud and i may regret that in a minute, but it just feels like leave me alone yeah Well, I imagine there's been times uh, you've all faced different things where you're just wondering what's what's the point, what's going on, and it feels just mean, and you're not really, maybe you blame God, maybe you just think this just doesn't feel fair, uh, and so, yeah, so I want to first talk about the, the cruelty of life at times, uh, and tell you the story about a guy named Mephibosheth, and so the, the quiz today is you got to be able to say Mephibosheth four times fast. I, in my notes, I just started typing the letter M. I got tired of trying to <laughs> trying to uh, spell it. It's spelled like that, Mephibosheth. But, um, yeah, so the background on his story uh, is his grandfather was King Saul, the first king of Israel. Um, so pretty important family. He's in the royal family there. His dad is Jonathan, who's... Uh, just a remarkable man, um, humble, loyal. Uh, early on, Jonathan realizes that his best friend David is going to be the next king, not Jonathan. So it should be Jonathan's spot. And when he realizes God's going to bless David, Jonathan is for it and is very supportive. So Mephibosheth, at the age of five, although he has no idea, uh, has everything going for him, right? I mean, he is in the king's family. His dad is a rock star super humble, super, you know, he's a, he's a le leader in military battles. And so all this going for him, he's five, he doesn't know any of that. But on one very cruel day, from Mephibosheth's perspective, uh, everything goes wrong. So we, you know, you read through the stories and you don't think about it from the five-year-old's perspective, but think about this day from his perspective. 
Uh, there's this big battle at Mount uh, Gerasene or something, I think it is. And um, Jonathan is killed. A whole bunch of people are lost. Gibeon? What mountain? I don't know. Second Samuel 4, I uh, will tell you. Um, and he, um, anyway, then Saul, because Saul did such a bad job, and he's, you know, he, he falls on his own sword or gets somebody to, to finish him off. And so Mephibosheth loses his dad and his grandfather and other family members. And then his nurse um, is trying to take care of him because in that moment, they don't know who's going to try to come in and be the next king. And so everybody in the royal family is now in danger of maybe somebody's going to come and try to take over and just kill everybody in the family. And so the nurse, trying to help out, runs, picks him up, grabs him. And as she's leaving, she drops him and he gets crippled in both, like hurts his feet and he's, he, can, he never walks again. So here's the, just one verse. Jonathan was the son of Saul. He had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Um, so pretty rough day for this kid. Like he just had everything, had a future, had everything, you know, in line for him. And that day loses you know, everything, loses uh, family members, loses his future, loses dignity, loses his sense of independence, and in all kinds of different things he'd have lost uh, on that day. Um, and just to kind of finish it off, his, he has a family member who takes him in, uh, and that family member lives in a town called Lo Debar, which didn't mean anything, anything to me, but uh, Nancy Guthrie points out that means no pasture. And so it's the, the town is like, deserted is like the name of the town it's like there's nothing here that's that's where he goes to live so you know from the palace to no pasture that's where he moves uh and his feet uh are messed up so um if if you maybe have thought of specific situations uh times where you feel like life just isn't going your way uh or just in general when that kind of feeling comes when, when those difficult moments how, how do you feel about life like what do you what are you thinking what are your emotions toward life when you're just down you're kicked while you're down and spit on while you're down and everything's going the wrong way <laughs> yeah come on back Jesus come on back yeah yeah what do you think what do you think Mephibosheth felt so I mean as a five-year-old he has no idea but, you know, somewhere around his teenage years, young adult years, he realizes where his future, you know, he has to, somebody fills in the story for him. And like, this is where you were headed. And on one really bad day, this is where everything went. What, what do you think, how, what's his attitude toward life later on, do you think? Yeah, so the, the like, Job's friends theology of, you must descend somewhere, or the man born blind, the, the people around him think, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? You know, this idea of karma, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think some of his temptations are as far as his attitude toward God? What, where is his heart tempted to go? Bitter. Absolutely. Anger, hardened, absolutely, to think, yeah, to think, I don't, I don't want anything to do with God, mad, bitter, yeah. Um, all right, so let's leave Mephibosheth in no pasture land for just a minute. That's where he is. I'm going to pick up a different side of the story and then see how these come together. Uh, so the way after that day uh, that the battle happened and... Saul and Jonathan and a bunch of other people died. Uh, one of Jonathan's brothers, um, Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth, something like that. Uh, he try he takes over as king. He's anointed as king, not that he should have been, but uh, ten of the twelve tribes of Israel put him on the throne. The other two anoint the rightful king, King David, uh, over the, the the other two tribes. And that goes on for just a short little while. Uh, Ishbosheth, or however you say it, is murdered. And um, that's an ugly day, again. 
But then eventually David becomes king like he's supposed to be. He's, he is, he's put in charge of everything. And uh, 2 Samuel 7 uh, is God's covenant with David. So David, uh, you know, two tribes, ten tribes, and then he takes over the city of Jerusalem, the Jebusites. He, he takes them out where they shouldn't be. And so now he's setting up a, uh, the, everything in Jerusalem. And his plan, you know, day one, you know, in his, his first step is he's going to build God. Finally, God's going to get the temple he deserves. That's his plan. And God says, nope, I, I don't want you to build me a house. He says, I got, I got a better idea. I'm going to build you a house. And uh, so this starts, I want, so we start about the, the cruelty of life. I want to compare that to the kindness uh, of the king, the kindness of the king. And so thinking about the Lord and then about, about David. Uh, so this is 2 Samuel 7, 11, God speaking to David. He said, I will give you rest from your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Um, and so this is like a play on words in Hebrew that uh, house, temple is what D David wanted to build. And he's talking about um, building you a household like a, a family and a lineage that's going to last forever. It's what God's going to do for David. So in 15 and 16, he says, but my, again, God speaking, but my steadfast love will not depart from him, speaking of David's descendants, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So here's David showing up. He wants to worship God, and God says, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you. I'm going to show you kindness and grace beyond anything you uh, could have even thought to ask for. So this steadfast love we talked about last week with Ruth, it's used four times in, in the four chapters of Ruth. It's this beautiful picture of love, unmerited love that we don't deserve, just uh, amazing love. And so God shows kindness toward, toward David uh, in a powerful way. So before we get back to, to Mephibosheth and pick him up where he is there, um, think about that, just that amount of grace and kindness that God showed to David to establish his throne, to establish his kingdom, and to say, I'm going to bless you and the generation after you and after that after them forever. And we know that Jesus is the fulfillment of that line, that Jesus is the king that comes through David's line. And so that's a, you know, an incredible amount of grace and kindness uh, he, that was consistent back to his heart. He told Moses in Exodus 34, you know, he said, I'm the Lord, the Lord, the God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So this is who God is. He shows, he shows kindness. So before we get back to, to their story, think about God's kindness towards you. Where's, where are places in your life you've seen God show you kindness, like he showed to David and Moses and Ruth and Naomi and countless others? What's some of the kindness he showed you? About us experience any kindness from the Lord? Right. Yep. Give me a couple specific. Sure. Yep. Yep. Somebody else, give me something specific. I think it's, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna wait you out on this one. Give give me some more specifics. Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I I drove back from, um, we went to Gatlinburg just for two nights to see my parents, and I drove past Furman for the first time in a while. And um, it's beautiful. Like, it's really pretty. And I, I applied, I got into Furman. I was, I was very interested in Furman. Um, and looking back, like the things that made me choose Wofford instead of Furman are, like they don't, you know, it's not like things that you would add up on paper. You know, they were just kind of gut feelings God had given me. And um, yeah, I mean, I met Amber day two at Wofford. We dated starting two years later, but just like I was driving past Furman thinking back man, that was just God's providence that he just put me in the right place in ways that I didn't understand, you know. Um, yeah, see, seeing my parents this last week, I was just thinking about the grace of growing up in a Christian home, you know, and the kindness of that. And um, Yeah, so many hundreds of steps between, now, between there and here. And, um, Sandra was asking about a trip to Israel I had. She found something old online from finding something I, I've posted and uh, it, 2013 when I shared about my trip to Israel and just thinking man what you know it's, yeah that feels like it wasn't that long ago but that was it was you know, eight years ago now um, just yeah God's kindness all along the way so I'm, I'm waiting you know, I was trying to get your specifics because we, we did this with Lois this weekend we, you know, we're trying to help teach our kids to pray, and they'll get in a habit. Uh, they, they picked up a phrase from me somewhere, and I like it, so I'm not correcting the phrase, but they'll say, thank you for all the ways you provide for us. Okay, that's great. But to them, it, you know how anytime you say something habitually, you stop thinking about what it means, and I'm not sure they even know what it means to begin with, much less forget about it, but, um, but we're really trying to push them to like name specifics. And Lois has picked up on that just this week of like she was specifically thankful for these things. And the reason here why that's important is if we if we if we just say, yeah, God's kind. Period. Then we we don't feel that like we. Yeah. OK. God's gracious. Like we, we don't we don't feel it. And it has less impact on our lives if we if we if we don't really think about the ways he's being kind, um, because if we do think about how he's kind toward us, it's going to affect how we relate toward others. So how do you think that works? How does, if we have experienced God's kindness, if you've truly experienced His grace and His mercy, that He's being kind to you, the world's cruel, people are cruel, but you, that when you've come to the Lord and He's shown you kindness, how does that impact how you, how you relate to other people? Amen. Amen, Ms. Carol. Absolutely. Yeah, if we've if we've been if we've received kindness, it's a lot harder to be cruel to other people when you realize where where you've been. And the default position of our own hearts many times is defending ourselves and looking out for our own rights and our own privileges, whatever else. But when we stop and realize how much God has done for us, then it changes the way we relate to other people. So I pulled this one quote from the, from the chapter. Uh, Nancy Guthrie said, Instead of always being concerned about how we are being treated, about how we are being included, how our needs are being met, we're inc increasingly concerned about how others are being treated, whether or not they are being included, whether or not their needs are being met. And we're able to look up from our own circumstances and begin asking the question, 
whom can I show kindness to? And that is just a very different perspective on life than most people carry around. Most people don't walk through life trying to show, like asking, who, who can I show kindness to? We, we're trying to defend, okay, I got to make sure I'm taken care of and, and my family's okay and I'm, I'm okay, instead of being able to pass that on. Um, and so uh, she uses just one word, and I, I think it's worth pulling this out. Uh, the, we, we go from being recipients of grace to conduits of grace. So, Aaron, when you, when you built your house, you were telling me one time about underneath your driveway. Don't you have something? Do you have conduits underneath your driveway? Yeah, what's a conduit? <laughs> Explain to us that are not really good at building stuff what a conduit is. There you go. I told you you can put stuff in later. Yeah, there's other kind of conduits, right? Not just under your driveway, like electrical conduits and stuff. So recipients of kindness become conduits of kindness. So picture yourself as a big tube that God can pour kindness through, you know? So we, we are not the, the origin of kindness. It doesn't come through us. It just comes through us. If you've received kindness, then, then you got something in your tank that you can give away. And so it passes through you, like a w- copper wire going through a conduit or what, whatever. Do you do like a dog electrical fence or something? Or I forget what you were telling me under your driveway. Or, but you can put anything through it. You can put anything through that tube once it's there. And so uh, our, if, you've, if you've truly received it, then, then you'll be a conduit for it. So let's... let's Think now, David, all the kindness he's received from the Lord, what's he going to do with that kindness, right? He's received it. Does it become a conduit of it? Absolutely. Um, And he does it for two reasons, really. One, because he experienced the kindness of God. And two, because he's keeping a promise. He's keeping a promise. So if you go backwards in the story, back to David and Jonathan, when they were younger, uh, 1 Samuel 20 uh, yeah, I won't read all this, but uh, but it should please my father to do if it should please my father to do you harm. So that's Jonathan speaking to to, da- to Daniel. He said, "The Lord do so to Jonathan, and more also." Um, yeah, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, then you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as He has been with my father. If I'm still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die, and do not cut off your steadfast love for my house forever. Then the, when the Lord cuts off every one of your enemies of David, anyway, every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So David and Jonathan make an agreement. John, Jonathan knows his dad's a bad dude. This isn't going to last forever. But they make a, a promise. Jonathan's going to help David as much as he can. And David says, I'm not going to wipe off your family. Like, I know that your dad's the bad guy, but I'm not going to destroy your family. And if, even if you die, I'm going to take care of your family. And so here he is, he's, he's become king over two tribes, over all 12 tribes. He gets to Jerusalem, he wants to build God a temple, God's showing him grace. What does David do? He remembers his promise. He's received all this grace, he wants to show the grace. So he does some homework and figures out how he can do that. David said, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there's a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they, called, uh, and they called him to David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to him, He is in the house of Mekir and the son of Amiel at Lodabar. So he does his homework, figures out where this guy is, and he says, "That's I'm going to show kindness to him. So this isn't just a, a random act of kindness to kind of like balance out the scales of like, all right, God showed me, you know, 4.6 ounces of kindness. So I got to find just somewhere I can give 4.6 ounces. So, it, you know, he's no, he's saying I'm, I'm targeting, I'm keeping a promise. And I'm going to show kindness uh, to this specific person. And so, um, you know, imagine I, I don't know how much time has passed. So I don't know how old Mephibosheth is. Probably could have read it up and figured that out. But as soon as Mephibosheth is aware that, okay, as part of Saul's line, I could be wiped out. Like if they find me, they could want to just wipe out this line. So at some point, he probably could have been living in fear of like any day somebody could knock on the door and be like, you Saul's kid, your grandkid, you're done, you know. 
And one day that, that knock comes. Hey, are you, you a part of this family? Yep, come with me. We're going to see the king. Like, so he doesn't know what's coming. Uh, but King David uh, brought him from the house of Machir and Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell at his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. So just take two days out of Mephibosheth's life. The, the day when he was five years old, when he lost his grandfather and his dad and the ability to walk and all kinds of other things and his future and his hope, all that. Take, take that day and then take another dramatic day where he is carried out of Lodabar. How, how did they get him there? I don't know. Bring him to the king. He falls down. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And David says, you're not going back to no pasture. You're coming to my house. You're coming to be a part of my family. And you're going to sit at my table. So on that one day, he gets a lot. He gets a place to call home. Uh, so um, he tells, David says to Mephibosheth, all that belong to Saul and to his house, I have given to your master's grandson, you and your sons um, and your servants shall till the land for him. So he's speaking to Ziba uh, and make all this. But, Zeb, but Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. So he gets a place at the king's table, uh, and he gets a place in the king's family. In verse 11, so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. So I don't know what the food's like in a place called no pasture, but I imagine it's not quite as good at sitting, as sitting at the king's table, getting to feast with him every day. I don't know what his family was like, this random cousin or somebody who took him in, but he gets quite the promotion to the royal family to be one of the king's own sons. Yeah. Yes. He did. He did. Yeah. So Ziba, all the land that belonged to Saul now goes to Mephibosheth, and Ziba and his. 15 to 20, whatever, sons and grandsons and servants, whatever, all worked the land. It all belonged to Mephibosheth now. So he goes from nothing to a whole lot in one day <clears throat> after going backwards uh, on that step a long time ago. So from being an enemy to being family, from being poor to rich, from nothing to everything, uh, adopted in no more fear, no more hiding. Uh, all the kindness that the king, that, that he had experienced, that had been undone, you know, all, all that he lost had now been restored uh, and even more. Um, and so the, the good news of the gospel is in a very important way, the same king, the ultimate king, shows kindness to us. So the kindness of the king comes to us. I won't unpack all these. I'm going to skip through for the sake of time. Um, but we get the same things. We get a place to call home. Uh, Jesus tells the disciples, John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Uh, we get a place at the king's table. Oh, I didn't change the verses. Um, uh, picture Jesus the night before he's crucified, breaking bread, offering the cup. He get the, he's inviting people to the table, uh, and we get a place in the king's family. That was the verse I just had put up there in Ephesians 1. Uh, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So we get all those things, the same things Mephibosheth got. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to skip through this and say uh, this. Do life's cruelties only hinder us or do they also help us see the kindness of the king? So what, her, what she keeps pointing out over and over through this book, God does his best work with empty is that in, in, we, we so often see the negative things that happen as this, like, this can't be you know, from God, this is just evil or whatever else, and it may be evil, but we're, we're putting God in a box to say, oh, God can't use this. And so for Mephibosheth, the, all that he suffered 
was, was where he then experienced grace, was being pulled out of that suffering. And so in our own times of feeling like life is cruel, that may be the very place that God ends up showing us kindness, that we see the kindness uh, of the king. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's where it happens so often. So and when we see that, when we get to see the same, when we've experienced that kindness from the king, it changes how we show kindness to others. It changes how we relate to other people. Uh, and it changes how we go through the cruelties uh, of our lives. Our, our needs are met. You know, we have received everything from the king that we need. We have him. We're, we're part of his family. We don't need anything else. So we can pour out uh, grace toward other people. And when life is cruel, when life, there is hard, frustrating, impossible things that don't seem humanly like we're going to be able to get through them, we can say, I, I know ultimately God's going to work this out for good. He's ultimately going to bring about peace it may not be on this earth but we know that eventually we're going to be at a bigger table the the wedding feast for the marriage supper of the lamb we're going to be in heaven the biggest table ever with the greatest feast a part of the greatest family we're going to be a part of the royal family permanently and um, that gives us a lot of hope gives us a lot of hope the king has come and he's coming back we get to be with him Yeah, the world so many times would tell us, we've got plenty of reasons to be bitter. It's not helpful. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help anybody. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we got any closing comments? All right, let me close this in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the kindness that you showed to King David and to Mephibosheth and to us through your son, Jesus. God, you um, came in a miraculous way uh, as the king who loved the poor and the blind and the cripple, who brought in the lame and healed them. Um, and God, we, we recognize that's, that's us. Spiritually, we are lame and blind and deaf, and we, we have nothing uh, except for our sin. And so, God, we come to you uh, fully dependent upon your healing. And God, we are amazed that by faith we get to be a part of your family. Um, God, we pray that you will uh, transform our hearts by your kindness, uh, that we may show kindness to others. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this group as we go. Uh, throughout this week, that we would live out of the same grace uh, that you showed to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.